English language teaching under the cover. All right, well, welcome to English language teachers under the covers, uh, the English language teachers react. Video number one. Uh, I'm Neil. And I'm Rich, youtube.com slash Professor Rich. <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do with these React videos is we're, we're going to right now react to some film and TV shows that uh, present English language teaching uh, in some of their scenes. And we are going to react to them as professionals and, you know, give you clues to if they are good or bad and you know maybe what we would do differently. First clip, so you know Rich, is the Dead Poet Society and it's Robin Williams not necessarily teaching English as a second language, he's teaching poetry um, but mm -hmm. I think there's some things in the scene that we can garner some knowledge from. Let's have a look. Yep. A man is not very tired, he is exhausted. And don't use very sad views. Come on, Mr. Overstreet, you twerp. <laughs> Gross. Yeah, exactly. Related a little <clears throat> bit more to us, you know, when he's talking about don't use very sad, use morose. You know, talking about uh, intensifying language uh, is something that a lot of uh, English language learners don't pick up on. It. I, I get it a lot of with, in, in my classes when they first come. You know, very, 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 very sad, very angry. Very, very angry. <laughs> you know, I have to, yeah, it's true. Um, I have to admit, I've, be, I've become quite um, cautious in the way that I teach vocabulary. I, I pretty much never will say, like, use this instead of this. Mm -hmm. um, but I might say, well, there's a situation where you could use this, and this is when it is. And also, a lot less critical as well. <clears throat> and actually, this is something that I first got from uh, Michelle Thomas, mm -hmm. that he, he, he has a philosophy, you might remember, which is with grammar, you think it through and you get it right, but with vocabulary, you can guess, you can reach, right? And um, since then, I, um, there was a key moment when I listened to a talk by um, a fella called Paul, can't remember, but he, he was one of the writers of New English File. Uh, the third edition, he did all the phonemic stuff in there. And um, he had a very interesting point, which is like, we we punish false friends, but we don't celebrate the attempt. And he made a very good point about this, that, you know, when someone says a false friend, they're actually doing something very good, which is that they're having a guess at vocabulary using what they think it's going to be. And maybe a lot of the time, it actually plays out all right. It's not a false friend, it's a real friend, you know? And the inclination of teachers is often to go, that's a false friend, you know? And it's like you're, you're kind of knocking a student down for trying something which is actually a good tactic. So what I always do now is when they say that is I'm like, nice try. Mm -hmm. However, in this particular case, you know, it's something else kind of thing. And I think that's well worth doing with any kind of vocabulary, you know. Um, I've seen other anecdotes, like um, there's one in Practice of English Language Teaching, uh, Jeremy Harmer, where he says um, there's some, the, the, he was watching a teacher and some Japanese fella said something like, um, you know, the, the wedding dress was very costly, you know, and the teacher was kind of like, oh, no, not costly, you know, expensive or whatever, right? And yeah. then suddenly this teacher, this Japanese guy whose level was a bit, lower than that really he was kind of looking a bit upset because he'd learned some fancy word and now he's getting he's getting beat over the head with it whereas in reality maybe it should be like that's pretty good yeah. it's kind of you know you should know something about costly though and then maybe explore that with the students and say look costly we use more for this this and this expensive for this and this, this but you know nice try kind of thing yeah. um, so i very much come around to that sort of attitude i like the though. idea of language as a play box you know, you just go in there and you kind of play around with it. Uh, so uh, this idea of uh, false friends and it being good at attempting good for reach, it makes sense. It's what we do uh, as children. We kind of try and, you know, we add the Completely ED yep. to make the past on everything. Mm, I go yep. to my 
to the park with grandma, yeah. that sort of thing. Uh, and then, you know, we do correct and it corrects itself over time. Um, the thing with that scene was I just, you know, with a lot of students uh, that come through various thrown onto the front of a lot of adjectives just to you know, add that intensity uh, and raise the, you know, the mm -hmm. strength of the vocabulary. Um, and I think you know, it's good if they can just throw very on everything. But I think there's, there's going to be stages where they're going to need to upgrade and take it to the next level. And mm -hmm. I think to point out that, well, you've been using very a lot. Have you thought about thinking as very as like a, an action signal? If you're using very, that means mm -hmm. you want to be writing down the adjective and kind of exploring uh, other words <coughs> that you could use instead if you're looking to take your English to the next level yeah, it's totally. kind of like a reflective exercise. Mm. Morose. Now, language was developed for one endeavor, and that is, Mr. Anderson, come on, are you a man or an amoeba? <laughs> Mr. Perry. Uh, to communicate. No. To woo women. Today we're going to be talking about William Shakespeare. Oh, God. I know. A lot of you look forward to this about as much as you look forward to root canal work. <clears throat> we're going to talk about Shakespeare as someone who writes something very interesting. Now, many of you have seen Shakespeare done very much <coughs> like this. Oh, Titus, bring your friend hither. <laughs> but if any of you have seen Mr. Marlon Brando, no, well, Shakespeare can be different. France, Romans, countrymen. <laughs> <laughs> you can also imagine maybe John Wayne is Macbeth going, well, is this a dagger I see before me? <laughs> Dogs, sir? Oh, not just now. <laughs> I do enjoy a good dog once in a while, sir. You can have yourself a three-course meal from one dog. Start with your canine crudite. Go to your Fido Flambe for main course. And for dessert, a Pekingese parfait. <laughs> and you can pick your teeth with a little pot. Uh, well, the next thing I noticed is um, it's a bit of a negative thing. Mm -hmm. And I noticed lots of positives, but we'll get to them later. Mm -hmm. um, so he definitely plays the role of the teacher as entertainer. Yeah. Um, now, I said it's a bit of a negative thing because it's something that I think... Um, I think teacher trainers have basically taken the uh, opinion of trying to shut that down quite a bit, especially at CELTA level, right? So they, they don't like it. They think it's uh, teacher-centric and uh, promotes TTT and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I think, um, I think there's a lot to be said for it in a positive way, to be honest. Um, it's just the problem is that on a kind of rule-based level, I mean, if, you, if you're pro programming a robot to be a teacher trainer, then the easy way to program that robot is to say, uh, if they see a teacher who's being teacher as entertainer, then tell them not to do that. It's not about them. Make it more student-centric, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a lot more complex than that. And I think there's something to be said for the teacher as entertainer, actually. Um, it's just, yeah, obviously you don't want to be just be sitting there and getting the spotlight on you and soaking it up for 60 minutes. That's not the point. But, um, uh, there's a, there's a, a nice, um, a nice idea by Jamie Keddy about teacher talk time. He says we should, um, take our focus away from teacher talk time and TTT and stop obsessing about it so much and talk about teacher talk quality. Because teacher-centric talk can be beneficial, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's more the rationale of it. What's it doing when you're doing that? And I think in this scene with Robin Williams, you know, he is doing something, isn't he? He's motivating the students. He's inspiring the students. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he, there's a rationale there for, for what he's doing. And with the background, you know, they're at private schools. It's kind of a bit... Um... Yeah, you know, conservative, very closed off, but you know, kind of a bit lame, a bit boring. So, you know, by him putting on a little bit more of a performance, it kind of separates that, oh, this class is a little bit different to all these other classes that we have. And, you know, they mm -hmm. kind of want to be there. Or maybe they there's this idea that, you know, 
as a teacher, you're, or, you're also a peer, and you, one of the things that we do when we're learning is we model the people that we you know, admire. You know, a son does that with a, a father. So if, if you have a teacher that's you know, very charismatic, and it's someone that you like, oh, I like mm. the way he's speaking. You know, he speaks in a really cool way. I want to emulate that. Yeah. You know, then that just adds a little bit more fire uh, yeah. into, you know, the, the students. Uh, I think there's definitely good elements. But like you said, um, when it starts to become a, a performance and it's something not to get the students engaged, but it just becomes, uh, oh, this is my time to perform. I'm a teacher. Do you yeah. know, just look at me, look at me. Then, as you say, it loses all that rationale. That yeah, totally. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's the it's the it's the beginner's trap, isn't it? The 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 teacher who's fresh off the boats can easily be like, wow, suddenly all this attention, you know. And you know, let's be honest, a lot of these people like me as well you know uh, I wasn't going into teaching like some sort of super popular uh, rock star style person you know and then you go into an, every class when you're a teacher uh, especially the first couple of classes you know it's all about you isn't it it's kind of it's it can be it can be the rich show if you want it to be so it's a it's a trap that teachers can definitely fall into um, and uh, and that's probably why they they bash it on the head so much in the Celta, you know, because they're like, oh, we want to need to get people out of this. Why do I stand up here? Anybody? To feel taller. No. Thank you for playing, Mr. Dalton. <laughs> I stand upon my desk to remind myself that we must constantly look at things in a different way. See, the world looks very different from up here. Don't believe me? Come see for yourselves. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Just when you think you know something, you have to look at it in another way. Even though it may seem silly or wrong, you must try. Now, when you read, don't just consider what the author thinks. Consider what you think. Boys, you must strive to find your own voice. Because the longer you wait to begin, the less likely you are to find it at all. Thoreau said most men lead lives of quiet desperation. Don't be resigned to that. Break out. Don't just walk off the edge like lemmings. Look around you. There. There you go, Mr. Christie. Thank you. Yes. Dare to strike out and find new ground. Um, but, you know, later, the, uh, later on, I think, there's definitely arguments for bringing it back, like you're saying. I think the point that you made about being a sort of inspirational figure for your students, I think that's huge, actually. I think that's huge. I, I mean, once you said that, I immediately started to think of students that that had happened with, with me, you know. And um, it's true, you know, it really, it does inspire them. You know, they do get inspired by that. They do think, oh, my teacher's kind of cool. Well, I, I want to sort of be a bit more like them. And, um, and it motivates them and it inspires them. And it's great. Yeah. Uh, anything else that you, uh, you've mentioned some of the positives, uh, any negatives that you want to cover or anything else you want to cover about that um, clip? Well, that, that kind of was the most negative thing that I wanted to mention, actually. Yeah. I've got some other positives. Um, okay. Just see if I can, I can think about it. Okay, so the standing on the desk thing, um, I do that. And that reminded me just of the sort of slightly kooky... You know, because to be honest, if we consider sort of modern health and safety and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. it's probably not something you should really be doing. But I mean, I do it. I definitely do it. Well, I think not, we can all, not all away, the time. We can strip away from the whole actually getting up on the desk because I do it. But I think the idea and his idea of doing that is to give that new perspective. And I kind of equate that into English as I do like a lot of assigning not what. Well, role plays but also assigning characters to students as, uh, yeah. as well so I'm yeah, like, no you're not who you are you're not bob today now you're you know juan pablo he's very charismatic so mm -hmm. when you are speaking english you need to not be you know bob or whoever you need to be juan pablo the very charismatic uh, latino guy yeah. uh, and you know that kind of allows them to 
take that new perspective and take that new role. And I kind of think that's what he was getting at with the whole getting up on the table in a way. Well, I think there's a few things about it. I think, first of all, he gets on the table and then he asks them a question, which is, he says, why do you think I got on the table? Which I really like, right? Because it's, that's, that's something you could actually do in an English class. You could get on the table and then say, right, why do you think I could get on the table? Right? Why do you think I got on the table? And then there's a negative, which is he says, anyone? <clears throat> now, that's something I do a lot as well, but it's a trap. It's a bad thing to do. Mm -hmm. Open questions. I, I think this is something where you can actually really say it's not something you should do. You should try and avoid it, which is open questions to the English class. Because you always get the, the tallest poppy answer in the question. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it, it doesn't. And the quiet and shy one will never be the one that shouts it out. So much better to nominate. Um, my my go-to is to nominate areas. So I'll say something like someone from the back, someone from that table, you know, rather than nominating individuals and putting all the pressure on one person. Um, and then you can get more of a mixed response. But I loved his question. Why do you think I got on the table? You know, I would have even, you know, in an English class, we'd, we'd make it conversational, right? We'd be like, why do you think I'm still on the table? One minute with a partner, what do you think kind of thing? And then feedback and see what they come up with or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and you never know, you might have You're some kind of interesting seeing, reason. Well, you know, what have I got here? What can I, what can I play with? Do I need to for me, it's, more than it's, just English or just a little For me, bit it's, um, it's intrigue as a motivator. The you've done something that's a bit out the box mm -hmm. and the students are like, yeah, right? <laughs> You're like, I'm on the table, guys. Why have I done this, right? And There's your this book, um, I'm not sure if it's necessarily an English language teaching book, uh, but it's a teaching book and it's uh, Teach Like a Pirate. And that's the basic premise of the book is, you know, creating intrigue, doing something different, doing something norm to what people think of as the idea of what a teacher should be. So, yes, he's getting up on the desk and, oh, that's intriguing. Teachers don't do that. But the teacher like a pirate idea is this person's coming into the classroom and he's, the, the teacher comes in and he's pretending he's, he's a plane. He's teaching the young kids and he's you know, flying around the classroom, you know, mm. try, he gets their attention. And he's like, well, yeah, hey, yeah. what am I? I like that. Oh, I'm a plane. I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna have a look plane, for that, that book. Sort of thing. It's, uh, that sounds really interesting, man. I mean, um, I've been fascinated by the idea of uh, intrigue as a motivator for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think you know a lot of the a lot of my favorite lessons involve that element, you know. Um, and I myself like intrigue as well. You know, I'm a big fan of the classic Sherlock Holmes books, and you know, any kind of mystery really, I think, is uh, is very very interesting. And yeah, I think I think that's that's why I like that particular action, doing something a bit odd, and then he asks the question, and then as you say, he moves on and kind of says it's about getting your own perspective. But then he does something as well; he physically activates the students, mm -hmm. everybody up, right? Which is you know that's something we do a fair bit in English language teaching, isn't it? Everybody up, right? And then everyone come round and stand on the desk. So everybody get up and do something that's a bit weird. Um, yeah, I think there's a place, there's definitely a, I mean, there's plenty of times when we do stuff like that in English language teaching, right? You know, um, the the classic version of um, <clears throat> checking understanding of, of, of like a, of like a grammar point or a vocabulary point is everybody up and then run to the left side of the room if you think that blah, 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 and run to the right side of the room if you think blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. You know, if the word is should, left of the room, the words would, right of the room, then you read the sentence or whatever, however you do it, um, just physically engaging the students in some sort of process like that, and we do that kind of stuff a lot. Well, I know so, that yeah, a cool. lot of dispute um, currently with kind of like learning, um, but having an idea of uh, hitting all the different uh, input points uh, for a person when they're learning it is good. So, you know, the auditory, the visual, but then we've got that kinesthetic and okay, maybe they're not learning much by <clears throat> running from left to right, but it's kind of, it's integrating that they've moved while they were learning that. And, you know, even having, uh, especially when you've got younger, you're teaching younger kids, if you're teaching action words, they have to be doing those actions it, unless you, 
you know, that is just stupid if you're not, you know, if you're asking them to, um, you know, jump, you know, you nice. don't just teach that vocabulary, you make them yeah. jump with that yeah, vocabulary. Yeah, sure, I mean, that's it's, standard, right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, I would argue, <clears throat> see, I, I, I've always, I've probably read the same, similar kind of stuff to you, Neil, that um, the idea of different learning styles is very controversial and all that kind of stuff. But I think you can rationalise it other ways anyway. Um, for example, I think, um, you know, for me, when I when I say everybody up, um, I do it as a... <clears throat> I do it as a physical kind of energizer. It's, you know, it doesn't matter what your learning style is. It's like, I know that if I say, if you've got a room full of teenagers, like you've got a room full of 14 year olds and you've got a two hour class and, you know, you get into the grammar part where they have to go and do a load of grammar exercises and they're all just going to start falling asleep in their books. You know, why not everybody up and you just do the grammar, you, you hold the book so you've got the grammar exercises and you just go through them, but you say, you know, run to that part of the room if it's A, that part of it's B, C, whatever, right? And it's just the same kind of thing, but now they're all standing up so they're not going to fall asleep, you know. Um, in um, in the Tilek, they refer to it as setters and stirrers. Yeah. Um, have you, you've heard that, yeah. I've, yeah, I've so heard they, that before and I, I completely agree with it. I think generally the, the whole idea that we have of, okay, you're... You've got to learn something, so sit in your chair for an hour uh, and watch someone teach you, or or be in, be in a classroom in general. It's so unnatural, so it makes more sense to be, you know, moving around. But using that with rationale, using that to you know stir or settle. You know, you can't just be like, okay, now let's just get up because you feel like it. There's got to be a reason for doing that to break up certain parts of the lesson. Uh, yeah, yeah, it should fit into the, the energy back in. You know. It should fit into the um, the lesson. Now, in addition to your essays, I would like you to compose a poem of your own, an original work. Oh. <laughs> That's right. You have to deliver it aloud in front of the class on Monday. Oh. Bon chance, gentlemen. So the only other thing that I would mention is. Um, his homework. Um, so uh, he gives them. He just throws in some homework there at the end, and they all get a bit of a moan, which is not a particularly good response. But at the end of the day, you know, from teenagers, you get that a lot, right? Um, what I didn't particularly like, and what I thought about, is he says to them, um, "You'll be reading it out in front of the class, right?" Um, so. I think that's a lot of pressure to put on a teenager in front of someone who's obsessed by social pressure, that they're going to stand up on their own and read out a poem in front of a class. And not only that, but you've just told them it now and set it for homework. So they might start, they might be thinking about that, <laughs> you know, like all week, <laughs> you know. So I instantly kind of thought that was a little bit cruel. It might be, might have been a better idea to say, uh, you know, you're going to do it and then read it out to your group right? And then you separate the class into four groups so they're with their peers, you know, let them get into groups with their friends and, um, and then all they, then, yeah, they have to read it out. Uh, but um, yeah, in front of the class, a mm, bit much maybe. I mean, if someone's confident, then you could give one or two students an opportunity to do that. But yeah, that would be my criticism there anyway. I've done stuff like that, um, reading out in front of the class. Oh, I, I mean, I, I've done it as well. I think I mean, it's, it, you can do it as well, and you, especially with teenagers, you can do it with teenagers and you can eliminate the social pressure, um, but it has to be done in a certain way. Uh, one of the ways that I was doing it, um, and it's something that I, uh, it's also a classroom management technique that I have where I'm trying to move people from the extrinsic to intrinsic. And basically uh, with the public mm. speaking and the debate stuff that I did in the past was I would, at the beginning of the year, I would not have them speaking in front of class, but I would take them outside of class and I'd just do like a quick video uh, record on the phone or camera if I have it. And then we'd just keep doing that for a couple of weeks. And after a couple of weeks or, or months, um, you know, they start to do it in, in their little groups. Um, but the, the point was that I go back uh, when I'm just before we're about to do it to the full class 
and I'll do another record uh, of their, their latest public speaking and they'll then I'll show them their very first one to where they're at now and almost always there will be a massive difference um, not just with their English but with their confidence and if they can kind of see that difference they can kind of feel it inside that they've made improvements they gain confidence and they know oh actually I'm not as bad as I thought I was and often that's what I find the reaction is is that they're just like well I'm so used to it now um, and I can see myself that you know the way I'm delivering it I'm not making uh, the mistakes that I did in the past so it kind of gives them confidence and that's kind of the point where I get them doing it in front of the class and we just do that going forward. Um, that, so, that sounds amazing, but it sounds quite labor intensive for the teacher. It is. <laughs> yeah, it is. yeah that's, that would be my issue with it, you know, and because um, it does, it sounds great, but you're kind of putting yourself in the position of being like a video editor as well then, no? Well, you're having if to you like... just, I mean, we've all got these, um, you know, smartphones now, you can just do a quick video. You don't have to, you don't have to edit it. Um, you only have to, the only ones that you have to edit is kind of like at the end of a term or a semester where mm. you've got the first one and then you've got like the last one or basically you've got the worst at the beginning and the best oh. at the end and you just mm. put those two together and there's plenty of apps mm. on the, the phone that you can you know, do that with. It's, it's not that labor intensive mm. but you know if you're like myself I like to uh, include that you know, with a, a report to the parents, and mm. then, you know, it's almost like you're, you're going to be doing it anyway. And, you know, the schools. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it depends how often you do it, I guess. Um, but yeah. And, the, I and mean, your class sizes, I wouldn't do it in a public school class, you know, in the training centers mm. where you've got 10 students. It's not so bad. Right, right, right.